Dr. D. Nick, thank you for coming on the show again, a third time, record breaking. And I got I to gotta start by asking you this and what probably everyone's thinking is, where do you find time to write these books? Because this is like the third, I, I haven't even been doing this podcast for a few years now, maybe two. And this is your third book, I think that came out in that time. So, I mean, is, is this like a, a passion of yours to write? Is this, how do you knock them out so quick? Yeah. So a lot of the research I've done over the past decade, and it's really just like sort of sitting in the, on the computer, just kind of waiting to be kind of put into a book, so to speak. A lot of the salt research was done years ago with the salt fix and just never really translated into um, athletic performance. So it's definitely totally a passion of mine and something that I hope to continue to do. No, I mean, it's it's an it's an encyclopedia of information. Each one of your books is incredibly thorough gives so much uh, value to the reader and win was no different here. And this one, you talk a lot about performance, about recovery, about becoming the optimal you. And for the audience that we usually get, it's a lot of patients, a lot of biohackers too, but I want to start first with some of the more topical situations that relate to patients chronically ill, those suffering from something. And one of the sections in the book going near the back now of this 500 page Goliath is immunity and the immune system. And, you know, right now we are still in a pandemic. And I looked this up because I was looking, reading and seeing all the things that impact the immune system. Of course, alcohol is one. And I want you to get into others as well. But, you know, a Nielsen survey showed that alcohol sales were up 54 percent during the pandemic. That means 54% more people, you know, were drinking more in a sense, and that lowers immunity. Can you talk about not just what alcohol does, but what are the other things out there that are lowering our immunity and making us more susceptible and why this pandemic probably hasn't helped with that? Sure. So I guess I'll address the second question first. Yeah. And that would be lack of sunlight, particularly in the morning and evening, um, which helps set circadian rhythms and actually sets melatonin release. And melatonin is super important for the immune system because it acts as a basically a broad spectrum antioxidant. And there's been actual clinical studies now, like randomized trials testing melatonin in COVID patients showing benefits. Um, so that's interesting. So sunlight is one. Two is obviously diet, removing junk, and replacing that with whole nutritious foods. And obviously, we know with the pandemic, most people are actually eating worse um, because they don't have as good of access to healthy whole foods. And with diet and with sunlight, you also have lack of exercise. And exercise is obviously, at least if you don't over-exercise, so typically that's as long as you stay within about, if you're vigorously exercising about an hour, you, wanna, you don't really wanna go too much above that because that can have some acute immune suppressing effects. And then if we circle back to alcohol, alcohol, hits your immune system in numerous ways. Number one, it's damaging to the gut microbiome. Number two, it damages the integrity of the tight junctions. This has been proven. So it leads to intestinal permeability. And it also inhibits the absorption of numerous nutrients because of the gut damage. So there's, there's been document. Mo, I mean, if you actually look at it from a clinical perspective, a lot of um, cases of Wernicke encephalopathy, which is basically, um, basically end-stage thiamine disease, thiamine deficiency is induced by acute alcohol episodes. So it really can push people very quickly into nutrient deficit, which can lead to very, very serious clinical consequences. Yeah. And one of the other things that impacts that you wrote about was sleep, correct? And a lot of people are having sleepless nights right now. So tell us how sleep impacts the immune system, what people could do to improve on their sleep. Yeah, I totally forgot to link the sunlight and the sleep with the melatonin mm. too. So mm -hmm. um, we obviously release melatonin starting typically after an hour of a decent amount of darkness. So really light and dark is what you know promotes the melatonin release and, and getting into that deep sleep. So one of the worst things you can do is have all the lights on at night. That's a lot of people sort of, especially my neighbors, kind of like uh, give, give, um, give me some jabs. Like James, your house is always dark by like 6 p.m. <laughs> like what's, what's going on? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's done on purpose mm -hmm. so that I can actually have the natural melatonin release. Because if you think about it from like an ancestral perspective, we would have never just been in bright lights. Once the sun sets, that's it. And so we are, we've evolved on these, um, these circadian rhythms, and we really should respect them for improving our sleep. 
Yeah, I mean, T.S. Wiley, who wrote books about this and hormone disruptors, said uh, the light bulb was the ultimate endocrine disruptor. It changed yep. everything for us and kept us up at night and kept the body thinking it's daylight when it's not. So right. that's, that's really big. And you do. And I love seeing this. You wrote about this in the book when as well is you said, turn off Wi-Fi, and minimize EMF at night. Go into why. Yeah. So if you think about it from a physiological perspective, we actually run on electricity. And so if you EMFs have been shown to potentially inhibit that. Now, this is different than um, we talk about pulsed EMF for actually improving recovery, which is different. But chronic exposure to EMF can potentially mess up sleep. Yeah. And it's something I, I've even been telling people for a long time. If you don't want that kill switch, as people like Ben Greenfield and others put in their houses, you could get a surge protector that turns on and off you know, right. at certain times, that's what I do. So it's just set it and forget it. And even yep. if you have, let's say a ring or alarm system, you get another one as far away and set up a hub, you know, router over there that keeps it on. So it's not impact you, you can still keep everything running. I mean, there's ways around it to automate this too. It's not as hard right. as unplugging every night, finding where it is, you know, rerouting it and everything. So, you know, talking about sleep some more, you're okay with napping, but only at specific times and specific lengths, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So especially for people who are in deep thought during the day, a quick 20, 30 minute nap, like around 2 PM is actually great. It helps to reset your system. And a lot of the large companies like Amazon and Google, they actually have napping stations now because they've realized that there's a ton of evidence suggesting that just instead of forcing you, yourself to work through and just continuously drink coffee to get through the day, if you take that quick 30 minute nap, that's, that's really all you need. And that, and that is actually can help people get off the, the coffee at night, which inhibits sleep as well. A lot of people use the, the coffee at around 2 PM for that boost and really a nice 30 minute nap could easily replace that. And talking about coffee and caffeine, one of the things I read in that I love that we talked about previously on the podcast was this idea of cycling caffeine. So can yeah. you go into that? Because it's something I love to do. I'm having my coffee today, but I'll have it for a few weeks, then cut off of it, go to tea or something else, go back and, and continue that cycling. But why is that beneficial? Yeah. So I think just from like, just kind of taking a step back on coffee, I think for its individual individualized, yeah. very much so. So some people can tolerate um, a lot of coffee and can even have coffee at night and it, they'll actually be able to fall asleep fine. It does still mess up the sleep pattern a little bit though. And then there's a, a lot of people who, if they have coffee, even at noon, they're not going to be able to sleep. So we need to understand that it's very highly individualized how people tolerate coffee. Um, and so from a dosing perspective, I think a general statement is that most people would probably um, benefit from not really going more than two cups per day. I think there's there's definitely cognitive benefits to having some in the morning, but once you start going beyond a couple of cups of coffee, you start to lose a lot of salt and fluid. You start to lose a lot of other nutrients, and I just think in general you want to the dose makes the poison. And with right. coffee, you really want to stay around that two cup per day limit. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, switching over now to another big subject, and I see you taking a big gulp there of your water, which is what I want to talk about, because not all water is the same. Hydration is incredibly important, especially for optimal performance you talk about. And you say an optimal hydration strategy should include water, but with salt and glycine. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So from a performance perspective, what happens when you vigorously exercise is you have blood that is now being pushed to the working muscle and also to the skin to dissipate heat. So from a relative volume perspective, you have a huge drop in blood volume feeding the heart because it's going to skin and it's going to working muscle. So of course, we're a closed system. You still have five liters of blood. The problem is, is it's all being shifted now away from the heart and that leads to a dramatic drop in performance. So you can see a reduction in blood volume of eight to 10% within just five minutes of vigorous exercise. And actually studies have shown that this is the primary reason why you have an inhibition in performance is due to that eight to 10% drop in blood volume. So if you can get ahead of the problem and you can hydrate prior to performance with salt and fluids to 
boost your blood volume eight to 10 percent you'll prevent that drop and you will have the most benefits you'll ever see in regards to any type of supplement for boosting performance and to give you a perspective like beetroot juice and and beta alanine they can allow you to exercise for about one minute longer if you use the salt protocols in win you can exercise up to 21 minutes longer so it's literally 20 times as powerful as some of the most you know best endurance optimizing supplements out there and a lot cheaper right i mean it's salt. A lot. <laughs> Exactly. And so what's really cool, how this works and how people should think about this is it's like you're filling up your, your fuel tank in the car so that you can perform better, but it's also filling up your coolant because we use fluid to cool the body off. And so if you can boost your blood volume by eight to 10%, you have that much more fluid to now lose from the intravascular space to the skin to basically cool you off, but you still have now the same amount of blood to fuel the muscle and fuel the heart. And so when you start thinking about your system as a fuel tank and a cooling tank, you want to boost and you want to hydrate before exercise. And the key why you want to do this prior is when you start vigorously exercising, there's a huge drop in gastric emptying. In other words, like fluid will just sit in the stomach. And so you can actually inhibit performance if you drink too much water when you're vigorously exercising and a ton of even experts get this completely wrong. Yeah, no, I, that's the cool thing about the book is that there is just great general information that, that you, you could find, but there's also this diving into other things. One thing that you mentioned, there was this idea of how you're cooling and, and salt water and doing that is a great way. But also I noticed this, that you talk about palm cooling before exercising. And that was, I remember a study years ago and I had to relook it up because it was talking about extremity cooling for uh, heat stress mitigation in the military. And it said hand cooling in cold water can accelerate body cooling from 0 0.4 to one degree Celsius in 10 minutes. So can you talk about, because you wrote about this and I found it really cool and I actually tried it the other day and mm -hmm. I felt great during my workout, by the way, uh, this idea of palm cooling prior to exercise and how that impacts performance and exercise itself. Yeah, it's a great question. And sort of what, what WIN is all about is sort of getting ahead of the primary problem. So a lot of people talk about palm cooling during exercise, and that is great, but you can get ahead of the problem. You can actually pre-cool the body. And so really WIN goes into all those strategies and how to do that. One of the best ways to do this is to use water because it conducts heat and or cold two to four times better than air. So originally, a lot of people were trying to use these cold rooms to pre-cool the body, or they were telling people to go outside in cold temperatures, and it would take forever to cool the body down. And it wasn't super effective. But if you can do what's called um, either Palmer or glabrous skin cooling, which is basically cooling the face, the palms of the hands, or the bottoms of the feet. They have special blood vessels called AVAs, arteriovenous anastomoses, which dilate really well, and they bypass the capillaries, pulling basically cold from the from the venous system right into the uh, basic arterial system. So it cools the body extremely quickly, which is why, like, if you put your just your feet, just the bottom of your feet into a pool, your whole body feels colder, despite you're only cooling maybe 1% of your surface area. And that's because the AVAs are highly innervated and dense in those three, well, even the ears too, actually have some uh, glabrous skin as well, which makes a ton of sense. So if you can cool those areas prior to performance, you can have basically improvements of endurance of around 20%. So you can go basically 20% longer, either in the heat or in regular uh, ambient temperatures. Where, whereas with salt preloading with um, salt and fluids and, and glycine, you can go anywhere from 25 to 50% longer. I mean, these are amazing hacks to, to really get to that optimal performance and you know, something that you don't normally think of, right? Palm cooling and other ones, is, it's not really brought up. So I was really impressed to see that. And another one prior to exercise we're talking about here, you said carb intake is good, or at least I read that. And you yeah. talked about maple syrup or orange juice. I normally do honey. Would that also be good? And, and why are those things good prior to exercise? Yeah. I mean, honey's probably not as good as maple syrup because it's mm -hmm. more fructose than glucose. Um, you want the combination of both actually, but you don't want, you want actually a little more glucose than fructose. But the reason why prior to vigorous exercise, 
consuming either whole food carbs, which I consider maple syrup, like, like a whole, like a more of a whole food carb, um, or things like Vitargo or Glycofuse, which are basically slow release carbs about an hour prior is because vigorous exercise will drop muscle glycogen by about 30% in just a couple of minutes. And so you, you can recap those uh, glycogen stores if you consume it 30 to 60 minutes prior to performance. Now let's go into exercise itself because there's so many different trains of thought. You outlined so much within the book, but you did talk about an optimal way to at least structure your workout. Now, can you go into that just a little bit? Because things like static stretching, you said, aren't a good thing to do prior. So let's right. go into what that optimal structure looks like because everyone has their own ideas on this, but let's go into the data that you found. Yeah, so the data that we looked at actually showed that static stretching can reduce strength. So like, you know, stretching out your, your chest before bench press, which is something I used to always do, yeah. um, can inhibit how much you can actually bench. So you actually want to do active warm-ups. So basically lightweight um, reps on a bench before you do um, like your one rep max. And so that was something sort of going against the grain in regards to that aspect. And then when it comes to training, you want to actually shift fuels. In other words, you want to train several days fasted, but you also want to train um, with carbs preloaded like an hour before. And that way you're basically developing both systems of glucose oxidation and fat oxidation. And you also use the same principles um, in regards to doing zone two training, which is like 60 to 70 percent of your max heart rate, and then lactate threshold training, which is like 88 percent of your max heart rate, and bouncing between those. Because when you improve fat basically as your fuel source when you're doing zone two training, that basically helps spare glycogen when you need it for anaerobic or vigorous exercise training. And so you, you use these principles of training to, to match and improve both systems of basically fuel oxidation. Yeah. And one of the things I saw in there as well that I tried myself and read about here and wanted to, again, for your input on it is blood flow restriction training. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I believe you're, you're a proponent of her. What does the data say about BFR? Yeah, even so taking a step back on blood flow restriction um, essentially was developed by uh, Dr. Katsu. Mm -hmm. And there's these, you know, Katsu bands that work really well. And essentially, you know, you go, um, you can put them on. You don't want to usually do legs and arms at the same time. You can do yeah. both arms. And then, and then after you do that, you do, you can do both legs. So, so high in the thigh and then high in the arm. Mm -hmm. And essentially what you do is you constrict blood flow. It's not a full constriction, but you, you do it while you're actually lifting and then you release it in between uh, basically sets. Right. And, and so you don't want to have it on for like, you know, too long, but from just a recovery perspective, not even using it to lift, but if you are like bedridden, blood flow restriction has been shown to significantly reduce muscle loss and to kind of sort of hold on and maintain muscle mass. So this, this should really be utilized in hospitals as well for people who are basically bedridden. And it's essentially mimicking exercise because it leads to hypoxia and blood pooling and, and oxidative stress that would occur with exercise. So you can actually lift at only maybe 40% of your max and you can get almost like the same gains as, this, as if you were maxing. So it's a safer way for a lot of elderly people too to lift because now you can get a lot of those gains without having to lift such heavy weights. Yeah. And another thing I read that was important and relates to the circadian rhythm section you write about is the time that you're lifting and going to the gym and working out and exercise. And you found with the circadian rhythm, the best time is 2 to 5 p.m. and not in the morning. Can you go into that a little bit? Because so many people believe that it has to be in the morning, you get the metabolism going and everything else, but our circadian rhythm says differently in a sense, right? Yeah, exactly. So in the morning, your cortisol is high. And then if you overstress the body at that point and you start you know, exercising and increasing cortisol on top of that rise in cortisol, it's sort of like counteracting itself. Now, that's not to say you can't do fasted exercise in the morning. However, most people need their best cognition in the morning. That's where you typically get a lot of your um, really good thoughts and creativity down and where you're the most productive. When you do exercise, that actually acutely tanks your cognitive function, your cognitive performance. And so it's best to 
for most people who need that cognition early in the morning and, and, and even midday to sort of wait till at the more later period of the day, but not too late. So we know if you start exercising at night, it's going to dramatically reduce you being able to fall asleep. So you don't want to usually work out past 5 p.m., but really that 2 to 5 p.m. seems to be that Goldilocks point for optimizing exercise. I'm just curious, is there any benefit to just general slow types of movement in the morning? Not a workout, like you're saying, going into that high intensity later in the day, but still being able to preserve cognitive function and focus for the morning. So let's say you wake up, you do 20 minutes of whether it's stretching, yoga, tai chi, some light, you know, body resistance, and then work out later, but also would that still preserve that? Are you tapping already into that? energy that you're utilizing in the morning for focus? Yeah, no, I think if you're not hitting like sort of anaerobic activity, you're not going to tax cognition as much. And so yet you can absolutely do things like that. And regards to stretching, most people think you should stretch prior to performance, but it's actually a lot of the benefits come from actually stretching after performance where you have good blood flow and you're not potentially statically stretching and inhibiting performance. So there needs to almost be a shift of focusing on stretching and massage after exercise versus prior. And let's talk about after exercises, because it's important what you do after exercise for recovery. So what are some of your favorite supplements or tips for recovering after a strenuous exercise? A lot of it can be done beforehand. We can talk about the strategies in regards like beetroot juice to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness, um, alkalinity to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness, salt and glycine will also do this as well. And cooling also pre-cooling will help with that. But what can you do afterwards? Um, It depends. Simply immersing the water in or immersing the body in water. So head out immersion, essentially where you're in a bath taking temperature out of the equation basically creates this anti-gravity effect and it allows blood flow to flow better, removal of waste better. And essentially there's less neuronal activity preserving energy stores. And so simply going into the bath um, after an exercise will improve muscle um, recovery out to 96 hours afterwards. And it's pretty. Yeah, totally. And one of the cool things I also read is that for muscle cramps, pickle juice, pickle juice, yep. really? <laughs> so yeah. Talk about that. There's two studies showing that pickle juice has been able to abort acute cramps within 35 to 85 seconds. So for for something to inhibit a cramp that quickly, it it needs to be working on probably the central nervous system in order to work that quickly because you're you're not really absorbing the salt and fluids that quickly. So I basically a lot of people have theorized it's the acetic acid potentially in pickle juice, which releases glycine, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which may be having some of the benefits. And certainly there, it's possible that there's a salt connection between the mouth and the, the oral cavity and the brain also having some type of um, basically neuronal conduction inhibiting electrical cramps, induced cramps. And so it could also be if you get a salt a salt solution high enough to match what pickle juice is that you can get the same effects, but it hasn't been tested yet. So really just sticking with the pickle juice is probably your best way to go. If you have a a cramp. Another amazing hack that, that I learned about, didn't know that before. So I'll, I'll stack up on the pickle juice. It's a good (laughs) good hack for sure. Uh, Let's switch gears to diet now, because so many people are really interested in what they're eating. And I know you're big on quality over just caloric, you know, intake and looking at the numbers, but looking from the macro perspective, you went into this pretty well in the book. What is the optimal breakdown of macros for athletic performance? So I like to just start with protein. I think for most athletes, they should be, their goal should be one gram of protein per pound of muscle um, or per pound of body weight, excuse me. So if you're 150 pounds, your goal should really be about 150 grams of protein. And so, so you start right, right there and then carbohydrate intake on exercise days between 300 and 400 grams is pretty good. And then on non-exercise days, maybe a hundred to 200 grams of carbs. And it's and a really, fat, well, that's really well-rounded, right? Because that's the thing I noticed. It's not so high stacked to one area or another. It is about that. And go ahead. What was that fat percentage now? And what are you looking at there? 
And then, well, yeah, when it comes to fat, you really don't have to have a lot of added sources of fat. You really shouldn't be putting a ton of cream into your coffee. There's no, really no need for it. Uh, it from a performance perspective, yes, you, you do need to have some fats and it's good to have some fats, no doubt, but try to get them from, from whole foods. You don't need to basically gorge yourself on exogenous fat. The one fat that people should probably be taking exogenously is the omega-3s for performance. So basically fish oil, high, high quality fish oil, and really the evidence shows that about three to four grams of EPA DHA per day can dramatically reduce delayed onset muscle soreness, decrease heart rate during exercise, improve VO2 max. And so DHA is like the pacemaker of the cell because it increases cell membrane uh, fluidity and allows amino acids, um, glucose, other molecules to fly in and out of the cell much faster. So you, you actually can increase your, your, basically your metabolic machinery by consuming about three to four grams of EPA DHA per day. I, I wanted to talk to you about this because you go into the optimal ratio, omega-3 versus omega-6, and how it's more balanced these days. It didn't used to be that way. And you mentioned linoleic acid LA. Now, I saw Dr. Mercola give a talk at the biohacking conference in which he said, and he ripped into chicken saying it's horrible because of the high LA content and basically saying it's a primary a uh, contributor to the chronic disease and acts as a metabolic poison. And it was funny because I think that day they were serving chicken to everyone. So it's like we're sitting there eating chicken, listening to him talk about how it's terrible. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I was kind of, you know, a little bit taken aback by saying chicken is the worst type of food out there. Right. Well, I think when it comes to tiers of linoleic acid being bad, by far and away, it's the refined omega-6 seed oils. And especially mm -hmm. when you cook with them, that is by far not going to have any type of benefit. And then sort of much lower on the list would be, let's say, pastured chicken that naturally contains linoleic acid. And really, if you're not eating the fat of the chicken, you're not getting a ton of linoleic acid to begin with. I mean, a chicken breast is like virtually fatless. So you don't have to necessarily worry about eating a pastured chicken breast in regards to, you know, dumping a ton of linoleic acid into the body. And that's where I think the idea of quality has to come into play. Because if you're yeah. eating like KFC, which is just soaked in that anyway, it's not actually the chicken. It's everything else that's on the chicken that's added to the chicken that's causing the problem, right? Exactly. And I think, too, a lot of these, if you actually look at wild game their fat content is actually slightly higher in omega-6 than even corn fat because actually the wild forage that they're getting is pretty high in linoleic acid. The difference is that their alpha tocopherol, which is vitamin E levels, are 10 times, at least 10 times higher. So you have all this vitamin E protecting the omega-6 from oxidizing. And you also have many, many other antioxidants. Beta carotene is higher, beta cryptoxanthin, all these other antioxidants that protect the linoleic acid. And so it's really not just, it's not just about consuming linoleic acid is, are you consuming things to protect the linoleic acid from oxidizing? Mm -hmm. Good point. You, you talk about in the book, ketogenic intermittent fasting, really popular things right now. What's the research showing about this in optimal performance, these two diet fads, you could say, but you know, approaches let's call them. Right. Yeah. So, so when it comes to vigorous exercise, essentially when you're exercising at 70% VO2 max or higher, um, and when you go into anaerobic activity, you don't want to be on a ketogenic diet. I mean, the, the data is extremely clear that carb loading prior to vigorous exercise does improve performance. Even if you are keto adapted for months, you're not going to get the same level of benefits on vigorous exercise when you uh, carb load. So carb loading with appropriate carbs at an appropriate time prior to vigorous exercise will improve performance. And if you're on a keto diet, your vigorous performance will suffer. Um, so we need to understand that. And athletes need more carbohydrate. Like they are working out, they are burning glucose. And so, especially at anaerobic activity, that's you, you, the only fuel you can use during anaerobic activity is glucose essentially. And so when you are a vigorous exercise performer, you need a good amount of carbs, particularly like around 300 to 400 grams per day to fuel your workouts. And then I think you asked intermittent fasting. Yeah. Yep. So I don't always intermittent fast on every single day. I think 
the two best ways to do this is like 16, eight, where basically you skip breakfast and you start eating at noon for like an eight hour window. And so you eat just basically two meals a day. That That's not a bad way to go. But for most high performing athletes, their, their body's going to be craving three meals a day. Yeah. And one of the things I also read when you were just discussing that eating frequency is that the studies you found were that eating your entire day's protein, protein that is in a four hour window had no negative effects on muscle preservation. Does that mean you advocate for sometimes getting that protein, most of it within one meal, let's say, even if you split it, getting the bulk of the protein in one meal, as opposed to splitting it throughout the day? Well, I think a lot depends on activity level and quality protein and things like that. I will say that probably for increasing and maximizing muscle protein synthesis, around 40 grams of protein four times a day is probably optimal. And even consuming 30 grams of casein protein, which is a longer acting protein 30 minutes before bedtime can actually help increase um, muscle protein synthesis. A lot of data is starting to come out that you want to really load your protein early in the morning, which sets your satiety throughout the entire day. Now, it's easiest to, this is the sort of the conundrum. It's so easy for people to just skip breakfast. However, consuming a high protein breakfast like steak and eggs is one of the best ways to sort of make people feel better, give them the energy for their workouts and set their satiety for the entire day. So I love a strong high protein breakfast. And, I, and, and especially when you are athletic, most people, you're going to see a lot of benefits by loading your protein earlier in the morning. If you're, if you're an athlete or if you're, you know, lifting a lot of weights, things like that. Now you mentioned satiety and talking about foods for weight loss. Now, what, what are we looking at with that? Because the, there are certain foods that can help you with, uh, you know, satiation and also lead to weight loss. So if you're looking at a weight loss, what type of food should be looking at? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's totally, you can talk about the type of foods. You can talk about the micronutrient status because micronutrients are what control um, basically energy metabolism in the body, glycolysis, which feeds into the TCA cycle, which feeds into the electron transport chain. All of that doesn't work without adequate, at least 22 nutrients. So you can eat all the highest quality proteins and, and carbs, but if you are lacking in any of those 22 nutrients, your whole energy system is going to be decreased. So you have to select foods, not just from a macro perspective, but really from a micro perspective. And you, and you know this well, because I covered that in my last book, The Mineral Fix. But essentially, timing of nutrients is also important. You want to really have your your protein and your fibrous foods first, and then you can sort of have more of your starchy or more glucose foods afterwards. And you can actually pair polyphenols like berries with some of your you know, more refined carbs, let's say, um, or more starches to actually decrease glucose spikes. So you can, you can like get surgical with your diet, so to speak, to optimize it. I mean, a lot of what I'm hearing is, is what sounds like the opposite of the normal American diet, because the normal American diet is usually, let's say, uh, you know, cereals in the morning and kind of breads and everything. And then later in the day, the big steak at 8 p.m., right? right. And, then, and you load up where you're saying, hey, that should be the opposite almost in a sense of things or, you know, cut out all the processed foods altogether, which is best. But that's, yeah. do you think that's part of the problem why people are sick? They're doing almost opposite of what you're seeing, seeing the data and research shows when it comes to diet? hundred percent. I mean, the biggest lever you can pull is to have protein right away in the morning because a lot of people are over consuming sugars and carbs because they don't have the protein to give them the satiety. Mm. So then they go for the, the, the sugar, basically roller coaster. They're on that sugar roller coaster for the rest of the day. So if you eat a huge steak and a couple eggs, you're not going to be craving sugar at that point, you know? And I do like to add like a greenish banana and some berries too in the morning, because I do like to have some carbs from an alkalinity perspective and, and from a glucose and oxidation perspective of that as well. So I don't want people just to think like I'm a carnivore, but I am total, I'm definitely animal based when it comes to the foods that I get from a caloric perspective are about 80% from animal foods and then about 20% from plants. 
Now, you also talked about, because I want to touch on that, that idea, and it, it's, again, so controversial, you know, carnivore MD, everything, just, you know, eating lots of meat. But you also talk about reducing acidic load to improve performance and even those potential renal acid load of foods. And some of those are the high protein ones, right? Those are the yep. ones that... so. How do you balance that out? Because, you you know, at, at one point, a lot of people are saying eat more meat. A lot of people are saying eat no meat. And right. there is some data to say, well, acidic load is something we need to look at, especially in highly toxic people. Let's say they already have high acid and are eating a little poorer quality of all this. Then you add a lot of meat. You could actually raise the acidic load. Can you touch on that? Yeah. So I've talked to um, a lot of optimal carnivores and I've had them. Uh, test their serum by carbs and their serum bicarbonate is the level of a 60 year old. And so just from that perspective, I have confirmed from publications of mine as well on acidosis that this is a real phenomenon and you can't argue with physiology. So essentially in order to, a lot of people argue, well, you can just breathe quicker and blow off acid. And that's true that you can get rid of acid through breathing, but there's a cost you have to deplete one molecule of bicarbonate in order to excrete one molecule of hydrogen. So you can get rid of acid in the blood by breathing more, but you drop your bicarbonate stores. And the second thing that you can't argue around physiology is that the kidney has a limited capacity for excreting acid before there is retention. And that capacity is essentially 40 to 70 milliequivalents of acid. And a carnivore diet on average is going to bring about 150 to 200 milliequivalents of acid. In other words, you are retaining one milliequivalent of acid for every two and a half milliequivalents above that threshold for the kidneys. And so a lot of people don't believe in that you can make the body more alkaline and more acidic, but you absolutely can. And I have published two review papers on this topic. So I, I do know what I'm talking about when it comes to this topic, which a lot of people really don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so what happens when you vigorously exercise is that the, the, the increase in lactate that occurs is actually due to the increase in acid in the cell. The lactate is actually a good molecule. It's pulling acid out of the cell and it's being utilized as a fuel. So if you can inhibit acidosis prior to performance, it's called hitting peak alkalosis. You can also dramatically improve performance. Yeah, really fascinating. And you know, one of the things you mentioned there, you mentioned that 60 you know, year age there, and I was really surprised to read between 20 and 60, a person's metabolic rate should stay relatively stable. And yet so many of us start to see as we age even past 30 or 40, that the metabolic rate actually goes much lower for us. And yeah. you talk about the culprits aren't age, it's things like chronic stress and overconsumption of the processed foods and a sedentary lifestyle. So let's flip the coin. If we know that there are these things like, you know, um, uh, more stress in our lives and everything that are causing that reduction and actually causing you to gain weight over time, what are the ways we can increase that metabolic rate as we age and help in weight loss? The easiest thing to do would be to eliminate the refined carbohydrates and sugars, which a lot of people understand now, and also eliminating those seed oils too. Anything that's going to damage the mitochondria and your ability to produce ATP is going to inhibit your metabolism. And simply from a micronutrient perspective as well, we need sodium, we need iodine, we need selenium for thyroid hormone function, which controls metabolism and basal metabolic rates. So increasing your micronutrient intake is super important as well. And from that perspective, sunlight also determines metabolism and sleep and all the things we've talked about. Um, exercise, building muscle is one of the best ways to increase basal metabolic rate and to burn fat um, because you essentially burn like two and a half times the amount of energy um, when you're comparing muscle to fat. So just, and this is why it's so simple for people to lose weight when they start building muscle targeting protein and eliminating junk food. Those three things will really turn around a lot of people's metabolism. And it really is that simple, right? There's no like soup, there's no pickle juice type thing for this. It is the, right. the, the fundamentals of being yeah. healthy almost impact all of these different areas. Even things like testosterone, because I read that so many people are suffering from low T men as they age, right? It's becoming almost an epidemic of its own. 
And you talked about how to raise testosterone, full body compounds like squats and everything are much better at doing that. But again, you have to look deeper into the culprits of why we have low T. It's not just that no one's doing their full body workouts. That's part of it. But you talk about things, poor sleep and even chemicals that are in household products. Um, what else is there that people should look out for when you're talking about testosterone and how we could reverse and increase testosterone? You, you touched on some of the best things. Most tea is released during sleep and improving sleep is going to dramatically improve testosterone levels as well as improving stress and diet and exercise and sunlight is all going to probably your biggest levers that you're pulling on are to help with, with testosterone. Inositol actually helps to increase testosterone in men and helps to decrease testosterone when you have in picos women because it helps to fix insulin resistance, which drives uh, basically too much androgen production and too much testosterone. So inositol is something I talk a little bit about in the book, how coffee can deplete it uh, and, and how actually some of our largest sources of inositol that we got during evolutionary times was from brains and kidneys and, and really blood cells. And we don't consume those things anymore. So something, so that's potentially why we see so much benefit when people start taking this substance is because the sources that were highest in our, during ancestral times are no longer being consumed. It's a much different time right now. I know. Yep. And, you know, one of the things we talked about previously were, was uh, the sauna therapy, infrared sauna therapy. I think we talked about it more so immune kind of boosting a little bit, as well as detoxification. What are you seeing for optimal performance and that heat versus cold factor that so many apply for optimal performance? Yeah, what's really interesting is what's called heat acclimation. And it's similar to dehydration acclimation, which I, I discuss both of these topics in the book. And essentially, if you go into the sauna every single day for about two weeks, you become heat acclimated. And that actually is one of the best ways to pre-cool the body because you adapt to heat acclimation by decreasing your baseline core body temperature. You increase sweat rates, you dilute the sweat so it evaporates faster. You become literally a faster and better cooling off machine when you are heat acclimated. And you may even be more resistant to the negative effects of having a heart attack, a stroke, anything that's hypoxic because you are sort of creating the same hormetic stresses in the sauna, just at a, at a lower level. And then you are adapting to those. So you become more resilient. It's like a time capsule. You go into the sauna, you take a quick hit, you come out stronger. I don't know if you ever watched Dragon Ball Z, um, but it's like becoming a super Saiyan, you know, like as, as Goku takes his hits the next day, he's stronger. It's kind of like that concept. I love it. You're bringing Dragon Ball Z into this I mean, amazing <laughs> classic, classic cartoon. <laughs> now, you, you know, I love my lasers. I do IV laser therapy. I, yeah. I apply it for pain, all sorts of things. And you go into photobiomodulation with uh, infrared light, red light. What is it doing for performance? I used to think when people talked about lasers, like they were crazy. Cause I'm like a really evidence-based person. And like, when you start hearing like, you know, laser treatments, your ear, your like instant skeptical flag kind of becomes raised. Ironically, photobiomodulation has probably some of the best evidence for any other biohack compared to any of them out there. Like it's pretty amazing how many disease states you can see benefits from, from the clinical studies you using photobiomodulation. Now, Essentially what this is, is most of them use what's called low level laser therapy. Um, and basically it's a combination of infrared and red light at certain spectrums. Um, typically it's about 630 nanometers all the way up to 950. And, and depending on if you're using red light or um, infrared, that's the spectrum though for the range, you gotta get it between that. But using these low-level lasers, either prior to exercise, um, after, or even better, combining it, has been shown to not only improve performance, power output, strength, but improve recovery as well. And again, it's probably a hormetic effect and an increase in release of nitric oxide and increases in ATP production when you're utilizing and stimulating things in the electron transport chain with infrared and with red light. You stimulate cytochrome C, and that increased the production of ATP and nitric oxide and things like that. 
you know, Dr. Dini, you have 500 pages of amazing information. But for the average reader that's uh, you know going to pick this book up, what are three things you'd want them to take away from this? The average person, I think, if they're looking for like when you look at the cover of the book, you think this is just for athletes, but really it's it's it is, but it's not because it goes into weight loss and fat loss. It goes into building muscle. It goes into recipes, meal plans, sleep, immunity, like the average person is definitely going to benefit from reading this book. So I would say the three most important things would be to, you know, get your diet right, get your sleep right, and really get your exercise right. Those three, sleep, exercise, diet, that, that's where it's at. Great advice. Listen, I got to ask you, you know, it's been over a year since the immunity fix, and we talked about that. We're still in this pandemic where, you know, people are really looking at the virus itself self still and not immunity. Do you think that's going to change at any point soon? Because you already saw, I think the NCAA said they're going to count natural immunity as being fully vaccinated. And you see what's going on in the UK that when they want to drop these things. Do you think this is the year that we start to actually understand that it's more focused on immunity and kind of understanding and boosting that? Are you hopeful of that? I think so. I think everyone, immunity is now top of mind. And I think what's really interesting is we're, we're understanding now how the gut microbiome interacts with the immune system and how our immune system is really controlling a lot of factors. And even when it comes to cancer and pre-cancer surveillance. So it's not just, we shouldn't think about it as like acutely boosting immunity just for that, just for like fighting viruses, but also from like a cancer longevity perspective, we want to make sure that our immune systems are, are, are functioning optimally. Now, I always ask you this near the end of every podcast we do. So I have to ask you again, what's the next book on? I would like to do something either on obesity or focused on uh, vitamin B1, thiamine, because like thiamine is sort of like the king of the vitamins and like magnesium is like the king to the minerals. So I already covered magnesium. It'd be nice to sort of kind of take a deep dive into vitamins. I am putting in my vote for that. We have that in our products. Natabeam, I take it all the time with thiamine. Love it. Great stuff. So I can't wait for that. Probably be out in a few months, right? Because you just knocked these out. But where can people uh, purchase the book and learn more about when? So book is on Amazon, um, paperback and Kindle. Unfortunately, no Audible. Um, and then also my website is drjamesdenick.com. Awesome. And if people want, they could also use the book to lift because it's heavy, it's big. They could do that workout with an awesome book. Congratulations again. Uh, can't wait for the next one. And thank you again for coming on a third time and looking forward to that fourth book. Thanks for having me.